こんにちは。Welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Kia ora, Catherine. How's it going? Hi, Jane. Going really well. Thank you so much. How about you? Yeah, all good here. It is not hot anymore, so I'm very, very happy. But also, I have been having a great time recently. I have been to Tokyo and I got to see you, and we had the most amazing meetup. The Jandals、oh. in Japan, a Jandals in Iki, wasn't it? Jandals in Iki Eatery and Roastery in Kiyosumi Shirakawa. Gosh, that's a long name for a place. <laughs> Kiyosumi Shirakawa in Tokyo. <laughs> Just was it nearly two weeks ago now or a week and、two、a half ago? ago? Yeah, just a、mm. week and a half. Yeah, it was great. Such a lovely place, right?、Um, they're doing so much there. And we just had so much fun because we just did a pop up, right? We said, just come if you can. If you've been a Jandal in Japan on the episodes, you'd love to be in, joining us, just come. And we didn't know who would come,、mm. right? Or for how long. But I thought it would just it, be you and me there eating our pies, <laughs> 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 which we did. We had some excellent pies. Beautiful, beautiful, you had the meat、food. one, right? And I, I had, had the, the one, vegetable、yeah. one. I had the、yeah. vegetarian one. Oh,、yeah. gosh, it was good. The pastry is so delish. And, and then I think our then, first arrival、yeah. was Ren. No, it's Teru. Oh, well, Teru was first. Teru was first because <laughs> he had the advantage. He's got the, he's got the advantage because he owns the place. Yes, the lovely Teru came and entertained us with his stories of getting himself into a rugby team in Auckland. In the 90s, from what、uh, it sounds like. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah Thank you, such a brave Teru guy. Harase, for holding the seat for us in the, the corner of the restaurant. We got a great view of everybody coming in, all the dogs with their owners. Oh my God.、Um, and your、dogs. story was so entertaining. Thank you very, very much for letting us have the space. And yeah. And then, then Ren came. Then Ren came. Ren Sayer. Ren Sayer. <laughs> what does Ren do? Ren Sayer is a copy slayer. So he is a copywriter. And yeah, he is also the son of Graham, who recommended Dave to us. So Dave was episode 10. Fantastic, fantastic yes, episode. Yes, Dave Mann. Yes, thank you. Kaizen, too, your Kiwi、Graham. business.、Mm. Yeah. So it was great to see Ren in person.、Yeah. And then we had. Jennifer、Ren、had a、appeared. pie too, didn't he? Everyone had a pie. Yeah, Ren had a pie. <laughs> <laughs> just, let, just letting all the secrets out here on the Jandals in Japan、Indeed. podcast.、Yes. What people ate,、um, and then Jennifer, the host of Iki Guy with Jennifer Shinkai, joined us, and she was、yeah. our honorary Brit at the table. She was, but she did learn some more Kiwi expressions and things. I think, and we teach her something. Did、and she was like,、things? I didn't know that. We went right into Kiwi mode, so she probably、yeah. had to pick up a bit there.、Yeah. But luckily, you know, the New Zealand flag does have a bit of British on it, so she was most <laughs> welcome to be there. Thank you, Jennifer, for coming. Your surprise visit after、yes. your return from the UK. It was lovely to see you there. Thank you. And we also had Adam. Adam, Adam. then came. Yeah, he did. Adam Hall, who was our episode twelve guest. Talking about Manuka Honey, told us a fantastic story, which we hope we'll be able to bring you on the show in the future. <laughs> And we were all just spellbound listening to Adam telling us some of his stories of business in Japan. And then finally, Chris Moore came all the way out to see us. Chris Moore from Movement. Move hyphen mint, isn't、yeah. it? Movement <laughs> Company Japan Limited, or Japan, sorry, Movement Company Limited in Japan.、Mm. Yeah, he does all kinds of video, videography, and bilingual story based branded video and photo content. And it was great to meet him in person. You'd met him the night before, I think, at the ANZCCJ's ANZCCJ's Gourmet、Group. Wine and Food Party. Yes, but I hadn't、yes. met him since I was engaged with other conversations. But it was great to see him, and he had a pie too. Oh, did he? <laughs> Catherine, keep a track of the pies. <laughs> I think they sold out in the cabinet due to the、yeah. in Japan, but it was just great, wasn't it, to have the pop up come and everybody just turned up and had a great conversation. Yeah, and we we loved it, and we just really want to do it again very soon.、Mm. So keep、yep. an eye out for that. Yeah, and yeah. As we said, we were, at, Iki. we were at Iki, and today's episode is about Iki. It is Iki Eatery and Roastery, and we can't wait to to bring it to you. Yes, so today we have、uh, we've talked a little about Teru just now, who is the manager and owner of Iki, and the other half of the duo who have created Iki is Kim. Kim is 
Tedder's wife, and she's currently in New Zealand, coming to us from New Zealand today. She's going to tell us all about starting up your own bricks and mortar business, a cafe or two in Japan. It's a great episode and so many learnings. I hope you'll enjoy it. Kia ora Kim, welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for including me. I really love your podcast. I've listened to all the episodes and I've learned so much from the fellow speakers. So I'm really excited about being part of this program. Oh, that's so good, Kim. It's Catherine here. And I really appreciate you saying that. We're, you must be number one gold, gold star for yeah. uh, <laughs> listening to the podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, so Kim, we usually start off, as you know, with a warm-up question. So this morning, what's your coffee order? I'm a regular single-shot flat white girl. Me too. Single shot flat white. Yay. <laughs> Catherine, how about you? Well, I used to be a single shot flat white, but now I'm a pure black coffee person. And I I never really liked black coffee, but now I actually understand the differences in the um, acidity and in the flavor with just a black coffee. So that's mm-hmm. my go-to, unless I'm going to certain cafes around town <laughs> yeah. and I will have a flat white as a treat. Yeah, we had one the other day, didn't we, at a certain cafe? We did indeed. (laughs) Kim, that was your cafe. We were so excited to be there. We took our Jandals in Japan team and had a meetup at your place, which is Iki, I-K-I, right? Iki, Iki's new roastery and eatery. And we went there and had lovely food and coffee and enjoyed your vibe. It was like really being in a cafe in New Zealand. Excellent. That's what we strive for. Well, we're so happy to have you today, Kim, and we know that you and your husband, Teru, have done so much to bring the vibe of New Zealand into Japan with Iki Espresso and your other outlets in Kiyosumi Shirakawa on the outskirts of Tokyo. And we thought it would be really great to have you on the show to help people understand about what it takes to set up a really successful business in Japan that's a bricks and mortar business, right, a cafe operation because you've got to have so much devotion to, you know, the excellence in the food and the coffee. But not only that, also have your clientele come back to you and keep bringing other people with you. So we wanted to talk with you today about that. So we'll put your full bio into the show notes, Kim, but tell us about your background, because I know you had time in uh, Europe and Vietnam and New Zealand as well, of course. But your background and also your inspiration for starting this cafe and coffee business in Japan. Yeah, sure. Well, I was born in San Jose, California, and my parents were both migrants to the USA, mum from Sweden and dad from England. And when I was six, my mother and I went back to Sweden and I went to school there. I graduated from Gothenburg University. And then I came to New Zealand on holiday and I really fell in love with the people and the scenery. I mean, to me at that time, which was 1988, New Zealand felt like a really curious yet comfortable mix of England and California, friendly, laid back, liberal people, sprinkled with a bit of British culture. And then Ted's passion growing up was rugby. And as soon as he graduated, Teru came to New Zealand to play at Teachers Eastern Rugby Club. It was always his dream to reach Division I in New Zealand, and he did. Wow. And uh, the club had arranged a homestay in Mairangi Bay, and he got a job as an inbound tour operator for a company called Newman and Kumagai. Mm. So I had an MA in education, and I got a job as a teacher at an English language school in Christchurch, and then... I became director of studies at a school in Auckland. And Teru's best friend and rugby mate, Ichiro, he was a student at that school. Mm. And one day I was introduced to Teru at a party. (laughs) Well, we met in June. We got married in December. Wow. And for our honeymoon, we went around the North Island at Teru's little Mini Cooper. (laughs) <laughs> we did the uh, Tongariro track, blackwater yes. rafting at Waitomo Caves and all sorts of adventures. And then shortly afterwards, we went to America where I had been offered a job setting up summer English programs for international students. And um, 
We settled in Alexandria, which is a historic little town on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. And Ted had played rock and beat with the local team there, and um, he helped me look after wayward Italian students. Um, (laughs) But it was in Alexandria that we came across this cool warehouse-style cafe called Coffee House, spelled K-O-F-I. And there were lots of little bars and restaurants in the area, and it was our first real encounter with quality espresso coffee, I think. And then we returned to New Zealand a year later. I became principal of an English language school in Parnell, and Ted wasn't really sure what he wanted to do beyond rugby, but his South Auckland rugby mates asked him to come and work with them at Carter Bolt Harvey making cardboard boxes. And Ted often describes this time as, as one of the highlights of his life because he developed really close friendships with the Tongan and Samoan rugby people there and workmates. And then in 95, we bought our first home, which was an early settler's cottage without a lean-to in O'Neill Street in Ponsonby. I think it was about 58 square meters and had three tiny bedrooms. And we had two Japanese rugby playing flatmates. And the four of us used to sit on this little couch to watch TV and and, and to oh drink. We were so poor. These were the days of 13% mortgage rates. Oh, okay, yes. Sounds... And we had an enormous mortgage. So, But around the corner, uh, Dissingoff was a really cool place for coffee. And then Bambino opened in 96. And in Parnell, near the school where I worked, there was a really cool cafe called Strawberry Alarm Clock run by a a funky Swede and his Malaysian business partner. You know, those were the days when we used to drink latte out of bowls that were like bird baths. I don't know (laughs) Mm -hmm. if you are old enough to recall those times. Yes, yes. Anyway, we spent a lot of time at these cafes and our local restaurant was Prego and, you know, our daily rituals developed around these these places. Well, our travels always included caffeine, whining and dining. And, uh, you know, at that time I used to visit Japan three times a year. I had to endure Dotour coffee in Mm -hmm. Japan. And then Starbucks came, but that wasn't much better. But I really had the best job in New Zealand, developing relationships with interesting people around the world. And then one day, Ted said, I want to learn about coffee. Mm. And so he contacted a guy called Brian, who at that time was known as the best barista in Auckland. And uh, he uh, got a job as a barista. He uh, then became cafe manager, first at a cafe called Cafe Francais. And then he started working for... Simon Ford, who's a bit of a hospitality legend in New Zealand. And he became manager of a cafe called Pavilion. And then he worked at Fusion and Hearn Bay and several other cafes. And then a Japanese investor asked him to set up a cafe from scratch in Queen Street. And that was his first experience in managing the process of setting up a business. So about this time, I had joined Academic Colleges Group as a group uh, director of marketing, we were setting up a new school in Parnell and a large international campus in Queen Street. One day, the general manager, he, he said, you know, I, I have a, a vision for these cafes in the, in the schools. We're not going to have normal tuck shops. I want to have good coffee. I want to have sushi, healthy food. And so parents can drop off their students, sit and have a coffee before they go to work. And he asked if we wanted to take the management contract. So that's how TESC was founded. And TESC <laughs> was an abbreviation of Tedder, Hannah, Humphrey, Ernie, Selma, and Kim. And those were our four dogs at the time. <laughs> Ted ran that for five years. We were uh, all press coffee customers and Ted got to learn to know the um, all press team and Mike all press. And Mike really wanted to set up in Japan and Ted and Mike, they went on a couple of uh, scouting trips together. And then uh, we entered into a joint venture agreement to start all press Japan. And Ted went to Tokyo, he found a building. Uh, He worked as general manager and dealt with the contractors, hired staff, all of that. 
And uh, Old Press Roastery and Cafe opened in August 2014. And it was a really great experience for Tedu and I. And it was during that time that Tedu also made a lot of valuable connections with professionals introduced to him by his sister who lived in that area. And Tedu chose Kiyosumi Shirakawa because of his neighborhood and, and he had history there. He stayed in the area as a student and his sister and husband lived there and it had a nice vibe, you know. It had canals, rivers, traditional cake shops. You know, they call it the um, Venice of Tokyo. And, you know, at the time he was cycling around looking for a building for all press, there was only one coffee roastery there. And a month after all press premises were confirmed, Blue Bottle from the United States uh, set up a roastery there. And I think today there are at least nine or ten roasteries, cool cafes in the area. It's now known as Tokyo's Hip coffee district and mm. Tedu had a large part to play in that wow Tedu stepped down as GM of all press and then we started our dream of opening our own place it was always our our plan to have a business where we could spend time both in Japan and in New Zealand so that's what we did and we opened Iki in January 2016 and from then, then until COVID, I would spend an average of one week per month in Tokyo and the rest in New Zealand. Goodness me, that is a very in-depth, you know, just how coffee has evolved in New Zealand and in Japan in, in quite a short time. And you guys are at the forefront of it. That's amazing. So is. And also, Kim, you're the word icky. What does that mean to you? Icky is an aesthetic ideal. Uh, it's a concept originated amongst the merchant classes in the Fukagawa area where, where we are. I guess roughly translated, it means cool or stylish. Mm. Uh, in Fukagawa, it, it began to be used to express Tatsumi Geisha, professional female entertainers. It was defined as being refined in dress and manners, but it also means knowing how to have a good time cool, tasteful character, you know, it fits in with who we are and what we try to create. You sophisticated sure retro of sorts. Mm. Yeah, I think sophisticated retro is what I would call your place. You go yeah. in there and you've, it is very retro, but the service is so slick and sophisticated. You just feel like you're the only customer in the shop, the way you treat everybody. And I love it. And Taylor is so engaging, isn't he too? He's very yeah. entertaining. Yeah. Well, he's doing what he loves. So good. How did he find the store? You said he found it. Did he just walk around and find a location? <laughs> I know he's familiar with the area, but finding a bricks and mortar store is pretty hard. How did he do that? Well, by cycling around. <laughs> uh, seriously, that's that's what he did. He wow. spent weeks and months looking around and, you know, he had help too because you know, Tokyo is a series of villages, and in a village, people know each other. And uh, his sister introduced him to a great real estate agent, and she was so supportive. And But he found that the first building himself by cycling around. You know, there are many empty buildings in Tokyo, but it's not always possible to rent them because sometimes the landowners can't be bothered to have tenants. They don't need them. Mm, that's mm. right. So the building he found after cycling around, was that empty? And he asked the Yeah, agent, it was empty and it was oh, by uh, Japan standards, a very old warehouse building. It was over 50 years old. It had been empty for years. I think the owner initially was amused or, or a bit surprised <laughs> that any, anybody wanted to rent it. But, um, mm. you know, Tedu had a vision and we got the building and, and we set about completely remodeling it inside and that's what we did is he is he gifted with this vision getting a building's one thing but having that vision for how to remodel it I don't know how he did that but is that his as well as being great at rugby I, I think <laughs> yes I think Tedder has a real knack for finding buildings in up-and-coming areas for sure I remember years ago we used to live in Mokau Street and uh, just off Richmond Road in Auckland. And uh, we went to West Lynn in Greylin. And he said, this would be a great place to open a cafe. And I said, 
what? There's nothing here. It's so quiet here. <laughs> sure enough, now that's our favorite part of, of Auckland. So mm. I, I believe so. He has a knack for it. And because of our travels, because we've had the opportunity to experience the best in, in cafes and in many corners of the world, I think, you know, we've taken back what we really liked and, and we put it all together. Yeah, I definitely felt that when I visited the roastery and eatery for the first time the other day, when, you know, just the, the atmosphere, it's not like you're trying to be super New Zealand, you're staying true to the Japan aspect, but also bringing in New Zealand, there was a bit of your home country Swedish food on the, in the counter as well, but it was all perfectly done it was all great wasn't it Catherine we had oh, yeah. some brilliant pies the best pies I've had I think even compared to New Zealand pies potentially <laughs> they were fantastic oh I'm so pleased about that because when I developed the menu for the new roastery and eatery I was in Sweden and I was hiking hiking in Sweden <laughs> as you do and uh <laughs> you know we've got to have great kiwi pies oh well yes what kind of recipe so I'm walking around there googling best New Zealand pies and and sending the links over to Cheddar and then luckily we we had this head baker who's amazing she can make anything and um my job when I go over there is is to taste everything and make mm. sure it's good. And I was really pleased with the pie, so I'm delighted that you like them too. Yeah, the pastry was fantastic. And you have like real tomato sauce there to eat them with. You know, in no, the not ketchup, right, Jane? Yeah, so tomato you're taking sauce. the time to get tomato sauce as opposed to just grabbing ketchup, which is readily available in Japan, like taking that extra step. It really is noticed by the people who are in the know, right? New Zealanders who go there would really notice it. And I'm sure the Japanese are curious about, oh, what is this, this sauce? This is. Oh, you know. they, they love those tomato containers. <laughs> they are the classic, aren't they? The kiwi tomato container. Yeah, yeah we hunted high and low for those when we well first done. set I up think my, If you need another, I think mum's got one at the back of her pantry. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, yeah. your baker is super and she's not only a great baker, but she looks, you know, you've got a glass cabinet there or glass into the kitchen and she will look up from her work and she looks at people who are lining up at the counter. So she's looked at me a couple of times and given a smile and I'm like, who does that? They're normally so intense in their work. Yeah, and well, there's a, there's a bit of a story there because she was one of our coffee partners. She had her own cafe uh, bakery in Niigata. And wow. uh, she had Iki coffee. And wow. then one day she contacted her and said, you know, I've been doing this business on my own for six years now and, and I'd really like to join a team. And Tedder didn't hesitate. She said, we have always wanted to bake our own bread. So mm. that's how it happened. That's wow. amazing. And she approached you that she must have really just known that that was a vibe that she wanted to work with and being part of your team, that's great for both of you. So this is one way that you've got these amazing staff members. People start coming to you. I want to work here. How else do you find just the right staff for your team? Well, when we first started, we, we used the Seek type agencies. They're very expensive in Japan. We get a lot of applicants from, from people who just have a notion that working in a cafe is cool. But, you know, finding the right people is, is challenging in everywhere in the world, I think. But we've, we've been really lucky in that we've had some excellent people. And either they apply, they contact us directly. Nowadays, we advertise through our own social media. Sometimes our staff introduce another person. So it's a mix, really, of how, how people get to join us. That's great. You've got some fans who are potentially waiting for the next chance to come and join your team. Yeah, and a business is not a business without the people coming in through the door too, Kim. And I know social media plays a big role in what you do, but how do you get those customers in and, and have them repeat? We were there the other day and there was a group of ladies and Ted said, oh, yeah, they're regulars. They come in every day. And I was like, how do you get people to come in every day? Why are they doing that? Do you know why? Yeah, it's probably the most pleasing aspect for us that 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 has happened because it was always our our goal that 
we would have a cafe similar to what we'd experienced in Ponsonby, for example. You know, I used to go to Dissingoff every morning and meet up with my colleagues from AUT, MIT and Unitech and we'd start off the morning for an hour and chat about where we're going next to recruit students and could we squeeze in some some fun time together and that sort of thing. And uh, it just became part of a daily ritual. And we said, wouldn't it be great if we could do the same, if we could achieve that in Japan? And we have. How did we do it? I think by creating a comfortable space. We we always wanted to be an anchor for the community. I remember when uh, Tetterfist showed me this building. He said, I found a building. Uh, I was going over there. I went and had a look. We got off at the train station, walked around the corner, walked five minutes, and all I could see was a quite a quiet street, right? And it I said, well, mm. where, where are the customers? And he said, <laughs> they'll come. Mm. And they have. Mm. So if you can create an atmosphere, an environment where f- people feel comfortable, they'll come back. You know, it's it's of course it's about the coffee and the and the food, but it's also about how we can make people feel when they come to us. And I think that transcends all cultures and backgrounds. We wanted people to come of all ages, all backgrounds, all nationalities, and make it the kind of place that we want to go to. I think that's the the key part. I love that you're tying in the Ponsonby aspect there, that it's something that you also experienced in New Zealand that you've brought through. And I, I'm just trying to think, but I don't think you say irashaimase when you come in, when we come in the door. I'm pretty sure you don't. Maybe I've misheard or not heard properly, but I feel like it's not really an official kind of welcome. It's a warm welcome through the person standing there and greeting you and, and taking you to the table right, and explaining, please just go up to the counter and get your order. But I feel like from the moment you come in the door, it's not, if I can say, official. It's, it is comfortable and welcoming. I'm, I'm so glad you're saying that because if you think so, then um, <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and, it and it also feels like yeah. you can spend your time there. You, you're not pressured to leave. And, of course, we want people to move out so that they can turn up, you can turn over your tables and have more people there. But at the same time, you've got a good clientele who are continuing to, to buy their coffees and just enjoy that comfort and space and tell others about it. We love that. Yeah, so back to the regulars. So um, we have people who come every day. We have some people who come twice a day. we got people who come every weekend. And then prior to COVID, we also had the destination visitors. These are Japanese who research coffee on social media, and then they come and they go from cafe to cafe. And, of course, a lot of expats, especially um, from the rugby community. So Mm. I remember the first week that we were open, I got an email from a guy called Daryl, a British guy, and he said, we live in the area and we've just been to Iki and I, I, I want to say thank you for opening such a great place. We've been waiting for this to happen. And that was so encouraging. But I want to take the opportunity to mention that for us, we wanted all family members to be comfortable. Ted and I love dogs. You know, we we have a background. My mother was a dog breeder. I grew up with 14 Pomeranians in the house. Tedda's grandmother and uncle bred miniature ducks hounds. No way. And so <laughs> we wanted a cafe. We didn't want a dog cafe, but we wanted a cafe where dogs and dog owners would feel welcome and any mm. other pets for that matter. So we brought lamb and manuka honey treats from New Zealand and we still do today and give to all of our four-legged guests. Mm. And um, in the beginning, it was part of a deliberate strategy to train the dogs to bring their owners to Iki and and it worked. (laughs) (laughs) So many of our regulars have dogs. Yes, we noticed uh, lots of them. You know, we have a family across the road that has a, a poodle called Kenchan. And we've seen Ken Chan from, you know, when he when we first opened, he was full of beans. Now he's a slow elderly gentleman and hug the griffin. He was in our first video. He used to be a regular guest, 
but he sadly passed away. But now we've got Hug Jr. coming. <laughs> and uh, Tiffany, who's, uh, you know, she's a gorgeous sable shivava with quite a following on social media. She's been a regular since we first opened. And oh, that's why I wanted to create a feature wall at, at our new roastery as a tribute to the friendly pooches in our community. <laughs> I don't know oh. if you noticed it, but oh, we uh, definitely did. Oh, yes. It's stunning. It was painted by artist Tado Mishibuya, and we call it Kiyosumi Social Club. <laughs> you know, we wanted a piece of artwork with positive energy that would bring our community happiness and, and gratitude every time they look at it. Yeah, we love that big mural on the wall above the counter and things. It really gives the the vibe of the place and your little four-legged guests are just so well behaved. And yeah, it was lovely to have them in the store as well. And just, yeah, everybody hanging out together. It was wonderful. Really love that. What are some of the other curious or interesting things about the business ecosystem in Japan that people might not know about. Like, I'm a little bit curious to know more about this. How do you get it so that you can have dogs and other pets in your store, for example? Is, it seems like that could be difficult. Is it difficult? I thought we would get more complaints, but from memory, I think we've only had two bad reviews related to dogs. We do ask dog owners that they are respectful and as you know, many people in Tokyo have dogs and love dogs. You know, they're family members. So I don't believe there's any permits needed to welcome dogs. Um, just like New Zealand, it's up to the owner to, to manage the situation and so it doesn't become a health hazard. But just on, on that note, I'm not sure if everybody knows that Tokyo has permissive regulations when it comes to setting up a cafe or a shop in an area like Kyosu Mishirakawa. You know, licenses to operate are easy to get. Rents compared to Auckland, I think, are cheap. Simon Wilson, who writes for The Herald, he recently wrote a really good article about this um, that he called Chaos in the Midst of Japanese Order, about how permissive regulations uh, infuse character into neighborhoods yeah that's really interesting i would have thought there would be a million hoops to jump through to be able to have dogs to be able to come into your cafe but it sounds like the cafes that aren't doing that are worried about potential complaints from regular customers and they most don't likely i would mm. say and another thing if, if people are looking at setting up a shop of some kind is that builders and subcontractors are incredibly efficient in Japan when you compare to how long things take in New Zealand. The new warehouse, which is a big wooden warehouse, it took only two and a half months to fit it out. And we had, really? wow. we had a project manager, we had uh, a 76-year-old builder, painter who's also a builder, some subcontractors, and they worked diligently seven days a week they were totally committed and it, it that building needed a lot of work and and two and a half months i i imagine in new zealand would take it would have taken well over a year i can imagine <laughs> it's a big space you had there isn't it but it goes beyond just uh builders and and subcontractors even things like business interruptions and in our experience, they've been minimal. I, I'll never forget when they were, I think, putting fiber or doing something. They had to, or they had to open up the whole road outside of Iki. And first came a letter delivered by hand by a man who bowed and, and said, you know, we're so sorry to trouble you. And they gave all the dates when they would be doing roadworks when they would start, when they would finish, they would come in the morning, all the workers would bow, then they would start working an hour before they stopped, they would clean up the street so you couldn't even see they'd been there, and then they'd come back and start again the next morning. And at the end of it, they all came in, they bowed, and they handed over an envelope with some compensation for the business interruption, which was oh minimal. Mm. You compare that to New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens here during roadworks. Mm. 
So that's yeah. uh, really oh, wow. positive things about Japan. I mean, there's so many good things about Japan. What's well, excellent, isn't it, hearing that? You've just made me realize in my neighborhood there's lots of infilling of buildings. And I get a little annoyed about the noise, for example, but they do deliver the notes and they do come around and give you a little something at the end as well. And you think, why am I receiving this towel? Why am <laughs> I getting But it's just thank yeah. you for being whatever it's a token, right, of the appreciation. And I was going to say to you, what is it about the X factor of Kiwis that is great for Japan? But listen to this. You know, this mm. X factor that Japan has that New Zealand could really well adopt over there. Imagine the difference it would make. But back to that point, Kim, is there an X factor that I believe Kiwis so, yeah. have, that Kiwis have that you can bring in? What do you think? Yes, I think so. I, th I think that, you know, our concept of great coffee, beautiful food, friendly people, it really works in Japan. And, and we've modeled our cafes on the very best in, in New Zealand. We've also brought in uh, chefs from New Zealand. Grant Allen, for example, he's been over four times to assist with our, our menu to make sure it's right. And we've had Nathan from Hanoi Kitchen in Auckland. He provided training to our chefs. So we've had a few people come and help us. You know, it, as well as injecting our menus with, with Kiwi flavors, we put effort into ensuring that our service is Kiwi style you know, casual and relaxed. Mm, um, mm. You know, generally service in Japan can be a bit impersonal. So just before COVID, we flew our whole Iki team to New Zealand to encourage them to express more individuality. We, we took them to all our favorite cafes and restaurants in Auckland and Queenstown uh, for a week. You know, when you think about the best places in New Zealand, as long as they have good coffee a lot of it comes down to the staff yes the people yeah. gravitate towards places with friendly staff who are cheerful mm. and entertaining have a bit of personality and we wanted to encourage our staff to be a bit more like that to not be afraid to express their individuality mm. so we're, we're trying to motivate our Japanese staff to create that relaxed and friendly atmosphere and and we believe that the Japanese respond well to that. I love how you put that little bit of extra effort into taking them all the way to New Zealand and giving them those ex different examples of what they could potentially incorporate into their own way of providing wonderful service. That is very next level, don't you think, Catherine? Oh, it's next level. And it's also oh so goodness. liberating for them. And that's perhaps why the baker looks up from her work and smiles. Yeah. Maybe others don't do that. And that's the difference that I noticed, Kim, is that there's that and there's the chap who brings it, the food to the table. And there's just a little bit of difference there in what they are doing. And knowing now that I can actually have a conversation too, and, and they might give away a few things that they're up to or that they're interested in and we can start a relationship in that way is kind of exciting to know when I go back there that I'm invited to do that as a, mm. as a customer. I love yeah. that. Wow. This is all sounding so good, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> there must be some pitfalls, yeah. though, <laughs> the too, pitfalls. <laughs> that, that people have to be careful about in Japan. Is there some one, two or three things that you think, just be a little bit careful about this? Ah, there are three terms in Japan that I don't like. Oh, tell uh, us. Yeah. Three terms. Uh, yeah, well, or expressions. Uh -huh. Let's think about it. Ah, okay. You know? Let's think about it. Yeah, let's have a meeting <laughs> to discuss what we're going to think about. Let's Ooh. have a meeting to discuss what we thought about. You know, Ooh, everything right. takes time, and I like to make decisions in action. Yeah. You know, it took it took us quite a while to get uh, some dishes on the menu. But the thing is, once the change is done, the quality is consistent time and time again. And, I, and you know, I think Japanese people like to do things to perfection and they're often risk averse. Now, this has the potential to conflict with our values, which are based on continuous improvement to the benefit of our, our customers. You know, finding people with creativity and, and uh, courage is a little bit hard in Japan. Uh, the other thing, we are doing it. 
it took me a very long time to learn that that doesn't actually mean it's happening. Uh, <laughs> it means that, yes, we acknowledge that uh, this might be a good idea. Mm, um, but it's not actually, right. yes, this yes. is, yeah, and, we agree and, and let's go ahead with it, right. Yeah, and hi. So uh, yeah. when I was uh, promoting New Zealand education, I, I once got a grant from Education New Zealand, a market development grant, and that year I visited 85 educational agencies in, in Japan. And uh, I'd go and, and present our schools. And over time I learned that hi, hi can mean anything from, yes, I acknowledge that, that you're talking to me, yes, I hear you, or, or yes, I'm still here. It certainly doesn't mean, yes, I really like what you're selling and you're going to get lots of students. I think that uh, New Zealanders, as, as many of your other speakers have said, you've got to learn to listen and you've got to learn to find out how you can add value. How can you help them uh, with their business? Exactly. Um, and, I mean, yes, in English is such a affirmative, positive Mm. word but again height is so nuanced isn't it fuzzy yeah. and cloudy and nuanced mm. exactly yeah. or like hi which is kind of like what, what? <laughs> <laughs> or hi hi yeah hi, i hi, hear hi. you yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. but i'm yeah. not going to yeah <laughs> you're so right learning to listen and really find out what they actually mean and then how you can add value into that that's really amazing mm. Anything then, since we know Ted is so good at the crystal ball gazing mm. Kim, of what's around the corner, what's coming up in Japan that people should be aware of? Maybe the, what's trending in your industry itself or what you see happening in Japan? Some of the other speakers have touched on this, plant-based food and milk. Mm. You know, just, even just before COVID, it was really hard to find good plant-based milk in, in Japan. We, we managed to get some through a trade show we went to. It was soya milk from Australia. But even in those days, we had uh, international visitors. They'd bring their own plant-based milk. And we have a uh, soya uh, shop around the corner. They, they've got an over 100-year history of making soya and, and tofu. But they couldn't really make milk that um, tasted good with coffee. Now, today we've got four or five different types of plant-based milk and vegan food uh, is a big mm, thing mm, as well. Mm. So I said to Ted about three years ago, we have a real opportunity here and we've got to be ready when, when visitors start coming again after COVID. Uh, so we now have some vegan items on the menu, which I'm really pleased about because I'm a freegan myself, 90 Five percent of my diet is plant-based, so those are the things I, I believe will only get um, more and more popular in Japan. Really great. Mm. Please tell us about what is coming up at Iki, and I believe you have a collaboration happening at the moment. We do. Antipodes uh, Skincare. Uh, we're we're doing a collaboration with them. Their new skincare range is about fermentation and, and probiotic, healthy things to put on your face. We have come up with a menu uh, that includes Manuka honey and Marmite as its hero. So think Marmite and avocado toast and Marmite cream cake. Mm. Now, uh, Teda assures me it tastes really good. And we sold lots of it yesterday. Brilliant. All right, I have uh, to try all... that. Um, I... <laughs> I can't even it's on it. for two. It. It's on for two weeks, and uh, I've also been in touch with Adam Hall and oh, nice. Poratu Manuka Honey, yes. and we're we're hoping that uh, before long we'll be able to offer the first UMF twenty plus Manuka Honey Latte <gasps> and oh. Manuka Honey Lemonade in Japan. No way! Oh my goodness! I'm so excited to hear this. He connected with us thanks to oh, the Dandelson Japan Network. We, we are thrilled. We went to, yeah, he came to Iki with us the other day. That's he right. He was blown yes. away by your premises and everything. So I'm glad that he took that step to reach out to you. I've got 
I've Catherine, got I've goosebumps. got like, I've got chills. I've got goosebumps. Yes. This is what we wanted, Kim. We want this community through Jandals and for others who are on the show, right, to connect with each other and do these kinds of collaborations. I am absolutely thrilled to hear that. Absolutely. Oh, I am absolutely thrilled that I've. Uh, Oh, that's my little dog sparking. <laughs> um, I'm delighted that that you've taken this initiative because uh, for me it it's been wonderful to connect with some people. We knew, of course, we we knew Don and Jason. Yeah. Uh, in fact, yeah. Grant Allen, the chef, is Jason's uh, uncle. Yeah. Uh, no way. But I'm looking yeah. forward to meeting more Jandals soon. I'll mm-hmm. be in Japan uh, on the 22nd of September. Oh, oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, there we so go. Exciting. Jandal's listening. Kim will be landing. <laughs> and Kim, just those dates for the Antipodes collaboration there. When is that? September? It's, it's uh, the 1st to the 14th of September. Brilliant. Boy, oh boy. We, I'm, I'm just, I don't even know what to say next. I'm so excited <laughs> for you hearing this. We didn't know you were going to say that. And uh, it's just terribly exciting to know that the Jandals in Japan community has brought uh, this kind of collaboration. Anything else, Kim, that we should know about or that you would love to tell our Jandals listeners? Yes, the fun stuff. I'm yes. going to Japan to have a party. Oh, good. Tell us. So we're going we're to have a housewarming party, Kiwi style, on the 28th of September. So if you'd like to join us, get in touch and we'll send an invitation. And and that invitation is extended to any listener. Oh, that's that's brilliant. brilliant. 28th of September, people. And that's at the roastery? Yes, it is. Mm, It is. Yeah. Okay. And then it'll be be evening, will it, Kim? It'll be from about 6.30 onwards. Hopefully there'll be a dance or two. That is so exciting. Kim, do you have a special for Jandals listeners? I sure do. If you'd like to try our Icky blend or a single origin or perhaps one of our gift boxes, please go to our online shop and enter the coupon code JANDALS2022 and there'll be a discount for you. (gasps) That's very generous of you. JANDALS2022. So the number 2022, yeah? That's right. And is JANDALS with a lowercase j or uppercase j? (laughs) uppercase j gotcha thank you so much oh that's really great i think uh we will have lots of jandals listeners taking advantage of that wow any last words kim yes yes if i may please you know we we do um events and pop-up dinners and we've got two catered events uh booked by education new zealand providers in october and uh if there's anyone out there who's thinking of holding an event whether it's a wedding or or a birthday party or a business meeting we we'd love to hear from you we're also looking for staff we would love to find an executive chef who um has a New Zealand background. We're also looking for a um, another baker, a pastry chef, floor staff, and an events and salesperson. So if you know anyone who's interested, please get in touch with us. Oh, my goodness. Shall we come and work with, with you, Kim? <laughs> I, so I want to come and work at Iki. <laughs> I have to move to Tokyo. Through Iki. We've been able to combine our passion for Kiwi hospitality with our love of Japan. And it it really is the best of both worlds. My mother always said that nothing of value comes easy and happiness is to successfully overcome a challenge. The greater the challenge, the happier you'll feel. So I would encourage anyone who has an interest in Japan to follow their ambition. If there's an experience in front of you, go for it very wise words there congratulations omedito on being a jandal in japan thank you for telling us today about your story uh, and about your journey and your tips for success and all the things that are coming we can't wait to see what's happening thank you so much for being a jandal in japan in this land of the rising sun oh well thank you very much indeed for the opportunity and uh keep up the good work Thank you, Kim. We'll keep Thank in you, touch. Kim. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. Talk about getting Torihara, what is it? Um 
Goosebumps. Right? Goosebumps. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. What a lovely story. That whole story at the beginning there. Wow. And then all the insights that Kim has and the things that they've got going on too. Ah. Yeah, so exciting. And that Jandals podcast has created some actions in the world that people are connecting with each other people are doing collaborations together oh my goodness it's happening hand already. on heart bless 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 that is just what we wanted that exactly. is so exciting so it's Catherine, worth it, it's oh, worth it. yes sorry sorry, sorry. <laughs> tell so us your takeaways i know you've my got takeaway. your top tip your top takeaways there i loved how she talked about the cafe being an anchor for the community mm. and i felt like Yes, with a building, you can have an anchor where people go to, but in anything that we do as New Zealanders in Japan, as Japanese with love of New Zealand and Japan, I think that's part of it as being mm. the anchor for your community. Look at Jandals yeah. in Japan. It's now an anchor for the community. I know. I'm so excited. Oh, my goodness. So, oh, I've got goosebumps again. <laughs> so <laughs> that said a lot to me mm. is that bringing that New Zealandness into Japan, but it was creating that purposefully. And look yeah. what she's done with taking the staff through to New Zealand to see what it was oh like my there and open their eyes yeah. to how New Zealand is friendly. And we know that we've heard about friendliness being taken to it. It's extreme, may not be the best <laughs> thing that Kiwis do, but we have a lot of it and we can harvest it. We just have to be really careful how much fertilizer we put on that friendliness, <laughs> right? And not make it too. But oh, isn't a cafe great. that's a community place the best place yes. to be doing that? Like that is yes. where it's needed, right? Oh. We don't need another sterile cafe chain like the D word cafe as you mentioned at the start, which is, you know, we're not going there for that, right? No. Mm. And it is like that as soon as you walk in. And I do feel that with Icky when you walk into mm -hmm. the store, you're not, you're working into this community and it's just beautiful. And I think the other thing that she really highlighted was it's not it is hard the things take a long time in japan yeah right a long time and she gave us those expressions which <laughs> will be yeah. interesting but it was the other side of that the flip side that permissions and regulations well regulations are permissive is what she was saying mm, and i yeah. think that was a really great point that licenses to operate are actually quite easy to get yes yes and it's quite easy to find well not easy but you can find cheap mm. rentals for your business just find someone who knows the market and get them to help right. you right yeah and then like adam hall said you know make sure you find a property that's not blacklisted <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't get yourself inadvertently blacklisted from rakuten don't want to be doing that yeah. yeah a great like real estate agent like they've got and honestly it sounds like that could be the person that gets a referral from uh, yeah. us here that yeah. well, from the people who've been on the show like from kim and teru they could obviously refer that agent but it's not as hard as you think. And I thought that was really great. We must find that uh, Herald article from Simon Wilson, a uh, chaos in the middle of a uh, mm. Japanese order. So we must find that to share. And I thought that was super, super, super wonderful. Yeah, no, I just really love the whole thing that they've done there, the way they've deliberately done it. But yeah, it just is natural. It doesn't scream New Zealand when you walk in there, does it? It's not like you are now entering New Zealand and there's ferns and korus everywhere. No. But it just feels right and the food is on point and the coffee is on point and, yeah, it's just, you and just know. And that's it, isn't it? You've got mm. it. You've hit it. It's not the koru and it's not those things which are symbols of New Zealand. It's the way we make people feel. Mm. Yeah. How do you make it's people feel? It's encapsulated in that building and yeah. in the experience of being there. So that's Feeling fantastic. Feeling and the comfort. Mm. Yeah. And that's why we can't wait to get back there. Right? We were just like, when are we going back? <laughs> we will be back. We will be back. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite an interesting sort of location. I was sort of wondering, why, why here of all the places? Like when we went out there for our meetup the other day and for the very first time mm. to go into that neighborhood, it's not a part of Tokyo I've been to before. But yeah, hearing the story behind it and, you know, why Tedo chose that place. And yeah, I think that the neighborhood will love back this cafe for being in the neighborhood you know oh, what i mean like they're definitely yeah and now that yeah. it's become a hub you know i mean a couple of streets over you will find those cafes that were mm, mentioned mm, and mm. you know there's a there's a place that makes cheese and there's oh a place goodness. that does yeah. ice cream you know it's a really is a lovely community and mm. uh, it feels very downtown and it, it's got a great mm. vibe and really has some rustic 
beautifulness about it. So I can't wait to go back and we'll do that very soon. Thank you, Kim, for a fabulous Yeah, thank episode. you so much, Kim. Make sure you check out that online store, get some coffee or other things that they have there, Jandals 2022. And, yeah, some of the other opportunities that Kim mentioned. If you were listening to that and thought, I want to work at Iki, reach out to Kim. We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> Especially if you're a chef, it sounds like she really would love to have someone with executive chef experience. To, it sounds like they need someone to help create the menu right which if you have that creativity that would be a great opportunity for someone yeah yeah oh, definitely so they need the baker the pastry chef and also that events and sales person. yes that's Ooh. another great opportunity for someone with that Surely. sort of experience with new zealand <laughs> potentially yeah all right there's someone in the community great mm. thanks so much kim again so we'll see you all again soon on another episode of jandals kia ora bye bye listening make sure you check out our guests links in the show notes this podcast is brought to you today by Catherine o'connell law and pod launch with jane if you have a great story you think should be on the show come and find us on linkedin or instagram we'd love to hear from you see you next time matane